Morning, guys. Um, today's a day that I thought we could never revisit. You know? And some that, unfortunately, many of us will never forget. No introduction. You already know who this is. And this video is going to be on both channels, my uh, sports channel and my music channel, so everybody who subscribed to them can know what I'm talking about here and how important this will carry with us going forward. <sighs> Today... Makes one year that it happened. One year that everybody's lives will forever change. And those lives were pretty much impacted by this tragic event. And one that we wish that never happened, but when it did anyway. Today marks one year where the whole world was at a standstill. And it was just painful to even think about. But you had to have to take the lesson by heart. Today is the one year anniversary and how we lost a legend, a beloved icon, a role model, a father, a husband, and arguably the most greatest athlete we've ever seen. Today is the one year anniversary on the tragic deaths of NBA legend Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, John Altabelli, his wife, Carrie, 13-year-old daughter, Alyssa, Sarah Chester, his 13-year-old daughter, Peyton, Christina Mauser, and Ara Zobayan. All nine people who were tragically killed one year ago today on that horrible helicopter crash up in Calabasas, California. And to many people this day, this still doesn't feel real. And it's kind of hard to accept in a way. And I don't blame them. Because this is like a hero, an icon, a figure that we believed that was going to live on forever until like dying peacefully at an old age. But in the most horrible of circumstances, it happened. And it was taken from us way too soon. <laughs> Kobe Bryant died at the age of 41 one year ago today. And his daughter Gianna was only 13 when this happened. And two other girls, Alyssa Altabelli and Peyton Chester, were also 13 years old. A lot of people's lives were impacted by this. Not only myself, but families, friends, fans, people who knew these people. They were all impacted by this. I remember sleeping after going out for the night and watching the Lakers take on the 76ers in Kobe Bryant's hometown of Philadelphia because, of course, we lost that game, obviously. But the biggest highlight was that LeBron James, who was climbing up in the all-time leader scoring board, had passed Kobe Bryant for third all-time in NBA scoring. And from what I heard, Kobe was at the arena 
before coming back here to um, take these people out for a basketball game, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Uh, and we were just spending time raving about Kobe. Even LeBron was raving about Kobe, sharing his fondest memories with them on the court and off the court. Their time together on the USA Olympic team on two occasions. And all of the sorts, you know. And then next thing you know, the following day, you're greeted with a tragedy. You went from celebrating an accomplishment to greeting a tragedy. That no one else will ever ex will ever forget. Nor accept. <laughs> Nine people, including Kobe and Gianna, were all traveling to a Thousand Oaks from Orange County to Thousand Oaks to partake in a basketball tournament that was being hosted at the Mamba Sports Academy that morning. Uh, Kobe was taking some members of his team because Gianna, Alyssa, and Peyton were all on his team, and Christina Mauser was the assistant coach. So they're all traveling. Because they're all family friends and whatnot. And they were all traveling there in heavy fog, as I can remember. Because it was really foggy that day. And um, they were on their way there, trying to take routes that could be able to help them elude the fog. But the next thing you know, at 9.45 a.m. that morning, the private helicopter that Kobe Bryant always took for like over a decade on his way to games, practices, and whatnot for years had crashed into a hillside of a mountain in Calabasas. And it was like miles north from up here in Los Angeles. And... It was the most horrible way for someone to go out like that. It was really horrible. And, um... Holding it in, because it'd be a shame for me to start tearing up. Anyways, the deaths were announced. Well, mainly Kobe's death was announced that morning through the television, the news media, through TMZ, Fox News, ABC, all that shit. And then... Excuse me. The facts of the story was all sorts of messed up because you had people uh, reporting that Kobe's wife, Vanessa, was in there as well. One of his daughters was in there. Then there wasn't his kids. But all of his daughters were in there. And Rick Fox was in there. I'm just sitting like, what the fuck? The media can know how to fuck things up when, when it comes to certain situations like this. Because TMZ was the first one to report on this accident. And they didn't even allow the um, sheriff's department to at least notify the families. Or at least conf confirm and notify the families about what happened. Before, before they broke it out themselves. And how they did it was very disrespectful. And for the media outlets, for them to capitalize on that without knowing the story of what really happened... It was really disgusting. It was really disgusting. And as a journalist, it really takes pride in how much you care about factual information and how it's important to get certain info out there, and make sure it's all for real and confirmed before you put shit like that shit out there, period. It's always important. And for the media to do something like this is really disgusting.
It was a sad time for us all. <sighs> for many of us who remember Kobe, he was like a figurehead in the NBA for us. He was like the Michael Jordan of our generation. And every Laker fan will tell you the same thing. We remember him capturing his first three titles all before the age of 25. Ages 21, 22, and 23, he's won his first three NBA titles with Shaquille O'Neal, obviously, the most dominant big man in the league at the time, um, doing most of the low while, Car while Kobe was helping him out before that horrible breakup in 04 after the loss of the Pistons. In which they damn near didn't even speak to each other for a year before reconciling and becoming the best of friends there from that point on. <laughs> and uh, on his own, Kobe was trying to prove himself, and which he did. Scoring on a rapid pace, especially the 5 6 season during a stretch where he scored 50 or more points in a week. And that same week, he scored that legendary 81-point game on January 22nd of 2006. 81 points against the Toronto Raptors at the Staples Center. We won that one, of course. 81 points in the modern era it was just fucking ridiculous. It just made us question reality. Because of him, he was that damn good. And it got further from there. He just couldn't win a championship in his prime. That wasn't until Pal Gasol came about, but it was like after, you know. We got to the 08 finals. Kobe was league MVP for the first and only time in his career, unfortunately. And we lost to the Celtics in six games. That was when Pal Gasol came about. Because in his prime, he played with Kwame Brown, Smush Parker, and Chris Mim, guys who you couldn't trust to fly with. But then that changed when they got rid of them to bring in Pal Gasol. And it changed our fortunes. We lost that finals that year, but we re we rebounded by winning back-to-back -back titles in 09 and 10. The 2010 win against the Celtics in that rematch was the pinnacle of his observation. Which I believe his career finally peaked that day. And um, he was one of the greatest individuals that we've ever seen in a long time. He capped that off with a, He capped off his legendary career at that moment, and his celebration afterwards, standing on a table with his arms out, screaming, in celebration, will always be down. Go down as my favorite all-time Kobe moment. Of course, the Lakers were going to mediocrity after that, and he had a fend for himself, but he gave us one last final curtain call on his final NBA game at the Staples Center against the Utah Jazz, where he scored 60 points, and the Lakers ended up winning that game. Now, I'll never forget the final two words that he said. Mamba out. That really stuck with us and how much he really wanted to give us one final curtain call. One of the greatest moments ever. And from there, he w looked like he was going to give us the arguably the greatest second act of his career. Because he was writing books. He uh, was a motivational speaker. He was coaching his youth basketball girls team. He won an Oscar for crying out loud for my dear basketball for dear basketball and damn it there was so much he can go on with there and yet we all been robbed of that we're never going to get that back nor will I ever see it again. <laughs> of course, I can't remember. I can't forget. <sighs> Jesus. 
I can't forget John Altabelli in this situation. Because from what we found out, John Altabelli was a former men's baseball coach for the men's baseball program at down in Orange Coast Community College down in Costa Mesa, which is in Orange County. And I, and I, and I know the school a little bit because I've been there twice to cover uh, my school's um, uh, games uh, when I was writing for the, uh, the school newspaper. I went to Santa Monica College. And I was covering uh, the football game and a women's soccer playoff game that same span in just a year. Or so, <clears throat> um, yeah, so I remember that. And um, Altabelli was their head coach from 1993 all the way to his tragic death last year. And he was a two-time Triple C Double A Coach of the Year. And he coached his team to three different... To three different, three or four, no, three different state championships. One in 09, one in 15, and one in 19, which is his final full year life of coaching, obviously, which is unfortunate. And former and current MLB stars like Tyler O'Neill and Aaron Judge remember uh, Mr. Altability quite well because they both played under him. Uh, when they were all in the Cape Cod League together. I forgot the team that they played in, but they were on the Cape Cod League in baseball. And they remember him quite well. And it tells you the impact that he has on his players and everyone else that knew him. So yeah, you can't forget him as well as you can't forget the other victims that, whose lives were lost that day a year ago. <laughs> It was the darkest day that anybody could ever think of. And many people said that was the beginning of the end with everything that's gone on since. With the whole COVID-19 pandemic, brothers and sisters getting killed left and right, the loss of Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman, and other celebrities you can think about. <laughs> and, every, and everything else that come, comes along with it, you know? Time really stood still for a lot of us that day. And you still can't believe it. In a way, I'm still kind of hard to process, or rather, accept in the fact that he's gone. And so is a lot of people, even the Lakers. Because before this happened, they said that they were not not going to wear the Mamba uniforms um, for yesterday's game that they played, not even tomorrow night's game. And they're not going to do a video tribute for him because it would have been all too painful to remember. Because they still have a hard time accepting that fact as well. So, And I don't blame them because it would have been too much and too painful for them to go through that. And I understand that. And for a lot of people, it's still hard to process anyway. <sighs> of course, only time will tell exactly what caused the helicopter crash in heavy fog. Hopefully... My next month or in a few months, we'll be able to get the full details of what led to the cause of that accident and how all lot, nine lives were perished. And I couldn't help think about Gianna in this scenario because months before they died, I was watching highlights of Ke of Gianna and her basketball team in their certain games, and she was becoming much like her father, uh, mastering the spin move, even his legendary fadeaway jumper that we've seen in uh, one of her middle school games at that time. I felt like she was going to be something. She was becoming like her father.
dominating the court, knocking people down, and just making the crucial shots when she can. And um, she was a, she was amazing to watch, from what I can tell. And yet she couldn't even have the chance to experience life. 13 years old, like, what the fuck? She didn't even have a chance to experience life at that. Jesus. Arguably the darkest day, one of the darkest days in American history and in world history, in my view, and in the history of sports. And it still lingers on in, in the back of people's minds. Sometimes you don't question God because he makes the best decision for his children. And if it's time for him to go, it's time for them to go. But this one you had to question because this was way too soon. And this is, and he was way too young to go out like that. In the most painful ways that you can think of. From a Laker fan to others here in LA, all around the country and all across the world, we all heal and we all pray together and make sure we live out the best of our abilities and the best of our lives as if they were our last. Because if last year's tragedy didn't teach you to enjoy life to the fullest, and appreciate the ones you got because you'll never have a chance to see them again or get another chance to live like this again. And I don't know what else to say. <sighs> yeah. Anyways, that's basically all I have to say in this video. One year later and it still doesn't feel right. Rest in peace to Kobe Bryant. Rest in peace to Gianna. Rest in peace to John Altabelli. Carrie Altabelli. Alyssa Altabelli. Rest in peace to Sarah Chester and her daughter Peyton. Rest in peace to Christina Mauser. And rest in peace to Aris O'Brien. May all those nine lives be forever in the warm, comforting hands of God's eternal grace. We love you all, and we miss you. Peace out, y'all.